What can be more spine chilling than ending up in an underwater cave at such a depth that the light of the sun cannot reach you? There, a person finds themselves alone with their body. The deepest recorded dive in history was made to 332 meters or 1089 feet, a tremendous depth. Today, we will talk about similarly dangerous and deep dives, some of which didn't end up the way the divers had planned. This story is creepy from all perspectives. It has murky waters, a claustrophobia-inducing cave, and a string of fatal coincidences. If you've been watching my videos for a while but still haven't subscribed, now's the time to do it. This way you won't miss any new stories. And now, let's dive into today's story. The number of people who can dive to a depth of 250 meters or 820 feet is less than the number of people who have been to the moon. At least, this was the state of affairs at the end of the 20th century. And it was in 1992 that a young man named Dion Dreyer began his diving career. He was only 18 years old at the time. Dion Dreyer grew up in Ferenigang, a town south of Johannesburg in South Africa. A true adventurer, Dion quickly became a professional and often took deep dives. In 1994, just two years into his career, Dion, along with some members of the South Africa Cave Diving Association, was invited to dive at Bushman's Hall, a cave that is 283 meters deep. Meaning that, for instance, nearly the entire Eiffel Tower could fit inside it. Dion's parents, particularly his mother, were against this undertaking, finding that he was still young and not experienced enough. But they don't invite just anyone to such difficult dives, and this seemed to Dion to be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that he would be foolish to miss. Absolutely, this is the way he saw it. He said, Dad, this is an honor being asked to do this. But because he was careful and conscientious, that, that's, that's why they wanted him along. But Dad, what did Dad think about this? I was okay with it. To, to, to me, I had the confidence that he would have no problem, but Mom, she was up in arms. She didn't want him to go. So, in the end, Dion's parents let their son go to this dive, which turned out to be his last. On December 17, 1994, during one of the training dives, Dion died at a depth of 48 meters. He simply never came back to the surface. His teammates later recalled seeing his flashlight go lower and lower and finally disappear. At such depths, as you can imagine, there reigns total darkness, and light wouldn't be able to pass properly through the small aperture on the surface anyway. Most likely, Dion died after losing consciousness as a result of the high work rate of breathing at depth, which led to the buildup of carbon dioxide in his lungs. At least, that's the theory supported by Dreyer's diving colleagues. They tried to look for him immediately after the tragedy, but his body disappeared deep in the cave, and with it, the mystery of his death. The young man's parents were informed of this terrible news, and another search for Dion's body began. His father hired a small submarine, which went down to the floor of the sinkhole and found nothing but Dion's diving helmet. His body seemed to have disappeared. Dion's parents never gave up hope of finding their son and burying his body. But as the months passed, the water in the cave remained still. After a while, they decided to pay a tribute to Dion with a metal plaque outside the cave bearing his name and two dates of birth and death. Ten years passed, Bushman's Hall continued to attract divers from all corners of the world, and in 2004, among them was Dave Shaw, an experienced and famous diver from Australia. In November 2004, Shaw, together with his partner Don Shirley, dived to the bottom of Bushman's Hall, where an unexpected discovery awaited them. Normally, divers in this cave move along a rope all the way to the bottom, spend a short time on the cave floor without letting go of the rope, and begin the long journey of resurfacing. But Dave did something that others don't normally risk doing. He stepped away from the guide rope and decided to look around at the bottom. 
He had a flashlight on his arm, which he used to eliminate the cave walls. He stepped a little to the side and let the light sweep across the floor. And then, just for a second, the beam of light illuminated something that looked like a human face. It was a skull with well-preserved teeth. Dave moved the flashlight further and saw before him a man, or rather a skeleton, he thought, in full gear wearing a diving suit with oxygen cylinders. Since every minute spent at such depths means an extra hours of underwater decompression on the way to the surface, every second counted. So Dave didn't have time to get a detailed look. He marked the spot where he found the skeleton. He knew right away it was Dion Dreyer, and he also knew that he would have to return him to the surface. But not this time, of course. The journey back took Dave 8 hours. You can't simply resurface from such depths. You have to press forward very slowly, spending several hours only a few feet away from the surface, so close and yet so far from land. Resurfacing abruptly is dangerous, because the human body needs time to decompress safely. Otherwise, the diver will suffer from decompression sickness, which can sometimes be fatal. Once Dave reached the surface, the first thing he said after taking off his suit was that he would return for Dion's body. I sort of having a look as I was going. It wasn't very steep. And uh, when I saw the body over on to my left, I went and tried to to move it because I was really puffing and panting. Hmm. So I didn't think it was real good at 260 meters. He told Don, his friend and diving partner, that he had already seen Dion's corpse in the cave in a dream and in real life, he found Dion at the exact spot where he had seen him in his dream. A blood-curdling story, to say the least. He had dreamed about finding the body previously, and the body was in exactly the same position as he dreamt it. He had a premonition? Yeah. And then the body was exactly as he dreamt it. Is there any doubt in your mind that the moment he saw Dion's body, that he was going to go back? No doubt whatsoever. At the time, Dave was 50 years old. An experienced and confident diver, he was well known and respected in the diving community and even had his own website where he reported on his deep dives. In short, Dave was a man who lived for diving. Before becoming a diver, he was a pilot. From the age of 18, he piloted small aircraft for crop dusting on farms in Australia. This was when he met Anne Roden, his future wife. Later, he worked as a pilot for a missionary organization in Papua New Guinea. Afterwards, he and Anne moved to Hong Kong, where Dave continued working as a pilot while also taking up diving. It was at around this time that Dave's future friend and diving mate, Don Shirley, opened a diving store in South Africa. It was in South Africa that they first met, becoming friends while diving in the Kamadi Springs abandoned mine. Shaw and Shirley spent a total of 100 hours underwater together, in only two and a half years. It was stunning being in the water with Dave, very relaxed, Shirley recalls. After his first dive at Bushman's Hall, David Shaw met with Dion Dreyer's parents and promised them he would organize a whole expedition to recover their son's body from the depths. Dion's parents did not insist on this. This was solely David's own initiative. It takes a while to sink in. It's, it, it, it's unreal. We met up and then he said, yes, I've been with Dion. And, and before I could say, will you recover my kid, he offered. Should I leave him there? He's happy there. Or should we recover? But then, yes, we went for the recovery. What were you weighing? Marty didn't have closure. The fact that Dion was missing, um, she hadn't accepted his death. He said, I'm coming back. I mean, that, that was Dave Shaw. He needed a reason to dive, and now he had a very good reason. Dave and Don contacted other divers capable of working at extreme depths, and together they created a plan to bring Dion Dreyer's body back to the surface. David's wife had sewn a special bag that Dion's body would be placed in underwater and passed on upward from diver to diver. They needed the bag in case the body would start falling apart, since it wasn't clear how much soft tissue there was left and what condition it was in. It could have theoretically remained intact 
having been underwater without any exposure to oxygen. But nonetheless, 10 years had passed, and after all, David did see a skull in the diving helmet. The team also found a film director by the name of Gordon Hiles, who agreed to make a documentary about their expedition. He constructed a special helmet for David that had a camera attached to it in such a way as to film everything from the diver's point of view. This was an important alteration, because it forced David to change where he held his flashlight. He usually had it attached to his arm, and when it got in the way, he would hang it around his neck. However, now the helmet was too large for David to hang the flashlight around his neck, so he decided that he would just let the flashlight float at his side and pick it up when needed. Though it might seem of no importance, after all, a flashlight is a flashlight, what does it matter where it's attached? This is actually a crucial detail. Every inch of a diver's suit has been thought out, nothing should just hang around randomly or get in the way. And most importantly, the diver needs to know exactly where his equipment is, especially if we're talking about lengthy dives that can take 6, 8 or even 10 hours. For instance, you need to make sure you're not dehydrated before the dive. But drinking a lot of water means you will soon want to go to the bathroom, but a diver's suit is waterproof and won't let any liquid in or out. It is important that it be well sealed to keep the diver's body temperature stable, since 8 hours underwater is more than enough to develop severe hypothermia. For this reason, even the way divers go to the toilet while underwater is regulated to the smallest detail. Dry suit divers use a gadget known as a P-valve, which allows bodily fluids to leave the suit while keeping it watertight. As for solid waste, many divers, including Don, use adult diapers. All this goes to show that every detail in a diver's suit is important, and even such a small thing as a change in the position of the flashlight can be critical. Most experts who looked into this case believe it was the position of David Shaw's flashlight that resulted in the disaster that happened in Bushman's Hall again. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. A week before the dive, David and Don went to a lake to train the procedure of putting Dion Dreyer's remains into the special bag. Don lay at the bottom of the lake while Dave put the bag over him. The rehearsal was a success. They calculated that the procedure would take no more than six minutes. David would only have to spend six minutes at the cave floor. And here is what David wrote on his website about the planned dive. This will be the body recovery of Dion Dreyer at Bozeman's Gat. The dive is in the late stages of planning now and will take place between the 4th and 12th of January 2005. The dive will be unique and huge. I plan on spending up to 5 minutes at 270 meters recovering the body. That will equate to a 680 minute dive on CCR. If I have to bail out, the dive will extend to 764 minutes. Once in the bottom, I have to cut Dion out of his dive harness, place him in a body bag, custom belt, hook a strong wire line to the dive gear, get back to the drop line with the body bag and the other end of the line fastened to the dive gear, hook that line to the drop line and then start my ascent with the body. Quite a lot to achieve in 5 minutes. The priority will be the body and then the gear. If I have trouble ascending with the body, I will fasten the body back to the line to the surface and it can be pulled up later. Assuming the ascent with the body works okay, I will pass the body to Don Shirley when he meets me at 220 meters on my ascent. Thus, Dion will be out of the water many hours before me. While on Daco, the support divers will be visiting me every now and again to see if I'm okay. They will provide me with drinks and food as required. This I will partake of while on air brakes. From 15 meters up, I will have air brakes every 30 minutes. After an air break, I will breathe 100% O2 on open circuit to flush my system of air before going back onto the rebreather, when it's 6 meters or above of course. Below 6 meters, I will flush my system with 50% O2 OC gas. 
On the surface, 70 meters up from the actual cave entrance, we will have a portable two-man recompression chamber. This unit is capable of taking a diver down to 90 meters. Large quantities of gas are required in the event of a major decompression incident. We will have over 50 of 50 liter cylinders of helium and 14 of oxygen just in case. To get the diver from the cave entrance to the chamber, a mine rescue team will be on standby. We also will have a doctor and other medical staff and equipment on hand. As you can see, the planning task is significant. More to come as I get time. Finally, the 8th of January 2005 came. Police cordoned off Bushman's Hall. Since there was a body recovery in progress, the area could technically be considered a crime scene. Dave, Don, and nine more divers got together, and David held a speech. I really must emphasize that the most important person on the dive is you. Okay? It's not me. For me, the most important on the dive is me. Okay? You must look after yourself. It cannot be any other way. Okay? It's better to have one person dead than two. Okay? It's as simple as that. In a private conversation, he also told Don that should he need help, he would call Don over using his flashlight. Nobody else on the team knew of this agreement. Don had asked his friend, If you have problems, do you want me to come down? Shaw considered the question and replied, Yes, but only come down if I signal. Yeah, the, the agreement was that um, if Dave needed me, he would call which is you, you, you signal with a light. Why wouldn't you have told everyone that? I suppose in retrospect, we, I should have said, you know, if there's a problem, I'll go down to Dave. Um, but I think it's part of the mindset that we didn't believe Dave would have a problem. Shirley also had a message for the gathered team. If Dave doesn't make it, if I don't make it, we stay there. That's the end of the story. We don't want to be recovered. Each diver knows their role and function. Each one is assigned a certain depth and knows at what time they will need to spring into action. The plan is as follows. David dives to 270 meters, backs Dion's body and passes it to Don, who is waiting at 220 meters, and afterward, the rest of the divers will take over, passing the body upward along their chain. I find myself back in this beautiful location after uh, the previous world record dive where I discovered Dion Dreyer's body so that the Dreyer family can finally put closure to the sad loss of um, their son 10 years ago. So here we are in January 2005, um, almost ready now to do the recovery dive. The mission started at 6 a.m. At 6.13 a.m., David Shaw shook Shirley's hand, said, I'll see you in 20 minutes and ducked into the dark waters of Bushman's Hole. The divers, who would be passing Dreyer's body onto the surface, took their allocated places. David started his dive. Some time later, Don followed him. It took David only 11 minutes to get to the bottom. Then he had to find the body in 2 minutes, bag it in 6 minutes, and pass it over to the surface through the line of other divers. It was estimated that Dion Dreyer's body would return to the surface 70 minutes after the start of the dive, whereas David would only come back after many hours of decompression. It would take him about 10 hours to resurface safely. A long period of decompression is necessary to prevent the development of caisson disease, also known as the bends. Gases dissolve much better in liquid if that liquid is under pressure. So the deeper a person dives, the more gases become dissolved in their blood. And the opposite process happens during resurfacing, turning the gases into bubbles. If the ascent is done gradually, the gases have time to get flushed out from the body, leaving it together with the exhaled air. But if the diver resurfaces quickly, the gases are released so rapidly that the bubbles can clog blood vessels, leading to all sorts of severe consequences, often even to death. Thirteen minutes have passed since the start of the mission. David has probably already reached the cave floor, and Don has also submerged. Work is underway. 
Very soon, Dion Dreyer's body, which has been lost in the depths for 10 years, should reappear on the surface. Dion Dreyer's parents are waiting at the entrance to the cave, having arrived already after David was in the water, so that he wouldn't feel any additional pressure from them. Also standing by the water's edge are the other members of the dive team and the director of the documentary. 70 minutes pass, the mark after which the back with Dion Dreyer should have been pulled ashore. But there is no one to be seen. 75 minutes go by, yet the waters of Bushman's Hall still remain calm. The dive team that was watching the surface thought that David simply had a change of plan, that things were fine but something went differently, so he turned to some plan B that they didn't know about. But when after some more time, two support divers resurfaced and said they hadn't seen anyone below, everyone knew something bad had happened. Hours went by unbelievably long. One of the support divers who was supposed to meet Dave suddenly saw two other divers going upwards. One of them was holding a special slate used for underwater communication. It said, did not meet D plus D at 150 for 6 minutes, one light below, not sure D's light off. Once the slate resurfaced, having been attached to a plastic bottle filled with air, the members of the team took it to mean that neither of the two divers would be coming back. Another diver decided to submerge in the hope of at least finding Don, and he managed to do it. The light he saw in the depths of the cave turned out to be Don's. The diver reached him, looked him in the eye, and asked if everything was okay. He then handed him his slate, and Don scribbled the following words, Dave not coming back. The support diver sent the slate back up. On the other side of the slate was Don's recompression plan. He had ended up deeper than planned, and his condition was risky. All everybody could do was wait. Only 12 hours and 32 minutes after the start of the operation did Don finally return. He was carried out of the water and put in a recompression chamber. After 7 hours in there, he was taken to the hospital. In the next 2 weeks, he had 10 more sessions in a recompression chamber. It took him over a month to once again be able to think clearly and walk along the street without losing his balance. Here's his account of what happened when he was in the cave. By the time Don had reached the target depth, he knew that David should have been making his way towards the surface, meaning he should be able to see bubbles and the glow of his flashlight. Don glanced into the deep. No bubbles, no approaching friend, nothing. Only the glimmer of his flashlight, and it wasn't moving. Don figured that David was most likely suffering from nitrogen narcosis, which has effects similar to alcohol intoxication. Don decided to dive deeper to help his friend. Keep in mind that they are separated by 50 meters of water. Don started his descent. At about 243 meters, deeper than he had ever been, he heard a noticeable crack. His oxygen controller had broken under the pressure of the water. At this point, Don realizes that he cannot continue his rescue mission, he must save himself. Without the controller, he would have to regulate the concentration of oxygen manually. This is a difficult and dangerous routine, since large concentrations of oxygen at such depths can make a person lose consciousness. He turned around and saw that the dark depth of the cave had completely devoured Shaw's light. Now, aside from losing his friend, Don had another problem. He was 30 meters deeper than planned, meaning that decompression time would increase, triggering a chain reaction. During the resurfacing process, Don started feeling nauseous, dizzy, and began losing control. Nonetheless, he pressed on upwards. As he approached the ceiling of the cave, where there is a narrow passage at a depth of about 49 meters, he felt weakness wash over him. His instincts told him to disconnect the rebreather, a gadget that absorbs carbon dioxide from the diver's exhaled breath and saturates it with oxygen so that it can be inhaled again. Now, Don was breathing for the tube of the emergency breathing apparatus, manually adjusting the oxygen levels. Immediately, 
everything around him started spinning. Don didn't know it yet, but a small bubble of helium had formed in his left inner ear, making him severely dizzy. He felt like he was inside an operating washing machine. Suddenly, he saw the glow of flashlights coming towards him. He grabbed onto something, and it saved his life. He managed to continue his tough journey upwards. After he used the slate to report that Dave hadn't returned, other divers set out for him, themselves diving to record depths. They passed on a message from his wife, who had already been told that he was in trouble. It read, "Message from Andre. I love you. You'd better hang in there, or else." After more than ten hours. Don finally got close enough to the surface to see light, but he knows he cannot just resurface. He needs to spend several more hours decompressing just below the surface before he can finally return to land. All while Dave, his friend and partner, will never return. Anne was in Hong Kong at the time. She never accompanied her husband to his dives and preferred to know nothing of what he did underwater. She felt more at ease this way, which is understandable. The remaining divers hardly had the time to say goodbye to Dave and come to terms with the fact that Bushman's Hall had now become the last resting place for the two divers. A few days later, they returned to the cave to retrieve the diving lines they had used, and a police diver came up to one of them and said that he had seen Dion and Dave's bodies stuck in the cave. When one of the divers arrived at the described location, he indeed saw David Shaw, his back against the cave ceiling. Just below him floated the headless body of Dion Dreyer. Shaw's flashlight had evidently become tangled in the cave lines, meaning that when the team pulled the lines out, the bodies went up with them. So in the end, David Shaw did bring Dion Dreyer back to land, but paid for it with his life. How did he do it, and why did they end up resurfacing together? And the most important question: What was the cause of Dave Shaw's death? This was something to be figured out. The police found David's camera helmet, which had footage that would help answer these questions. I'll leave the link to the whole video from that camera in the description, but I warn you that it is only for the bravest to watch. Here's how it goes: David reaches the floor of the cave. Leaves the line and finds Dion Dreyer. Now he must put him in the special bag. It's at this moment that something goes wrong. The video is dark, so it can occasionally be difficult to see exactly what's going on. Dave's breathing, however, can be heard rather well. When Dave reaches Dion's body, his watch shows that 12 minutes and 22 seconds have passed since the start of his dive. He's been on the cave floor for just over a minute. Dave takes out the bag and tries to get Dion's legs into it. As he is doing this, a cloud of silt suddenly rises from the floor. Once it has dissipated a little, Dave sees that Dion's body is now floating right in front of him, and his head has detached. This was totally unexpected. Dion, it turns out, was much better preserved than everyone had thought. He wasn't a silt-covered skeleton, but had turned into a mummy made of a soap-like substance. Watching the video, it's hard not to wonder why Shaw didn't just abort the mission. He was breathing heavily, and Dion, who was tethered to a rope, could rise to the surface without being put in the bag. However, Dave continues his attempt, and this is where the next problem comes up. Dave needs to use both hands to put the bag on the body, so he lets go of his flashlight and lets it float by his side. Don Shirley, who later on watched this footage, says that this was a very big mistake. Under no circumstances should a diver let any of his gear free float. Don, by the way, was initially against Dave changing the location of the flashlight on his suit, but he didn't share his concerns because it didn't even occur to him that his friend would leave it to float. After more than two and a half minutes of trying to deal with the situation. And three minutes and forty-nine seconds at the key floor in total, David pulls out some shears. His hands are shaking from the tremendous pressure and from the cocktail of gases that fills his lungs. His breathing rate continues to increase. Suddenly, he loses his balance. He climbs back to Dion through a cloud of silt. Dave continues to check the time on his dive computer. 
After five and a half minutes at the bottom, he realizes it's time to leave. The silt beneath him begins to move. He takes a few steps and stops abruptly. Some part of his gear has become entangled with the cave line. It's his flashlight. Dave makes several attempts to free himself. He is still holding the shears after all, but all to no avail. His breathing becomes more rapid. 21 minutes into the dive, the sounds begin to fade. Dave Shaw's lungs fill with carbon dioxide and he begins to lose consciousness. After a minute, all movement finally stops. Was this a tragically heroic act or a fatal coincidence? It's hard to say. When Don was reviewing this video after his recovery, he felt so strongly for his friend that he wanted to know how Dave felt at that very moment. He volunteered for an unusual experiment. He sat down with a special carbon dioxide monitor in his mouth, connected to his computer. He turned on the video and started mimicking Dave's breathing. By the middle of the video, Don was taking 36 shallow breaths per minute, which is a lot. The normal number of breaths per minute is somewhere around 14 or 18. David was exhibiting extreme hyperventilation, exacerbated by the fact that he was using a rebreather. Eventually, when David started blacking out, he was talking about 6 breaths per minute. Don repeated after him and nearly lost consciousness too. When Dave's wife found out that his body had been brought back to the surface along with that of Dion, she was disappointed. Knowing how much Dave loved diving, she had wanted her husband to stay in Bushman's Hall forever. Anne says she believes that Dave is in heaven now and that this thought helps her get over the pain of losing him. When I heard that his body had returned to the surface, I was absolutely beside myself. Um, and I, I, I would have happily said, just put him back. I wanted him to stay there. I found it very difficult when his body um, came up because that meant I then had to deal with the body. You, you realize that that's, that's very unusual. Very unusual. <laughs> the fact that he was dead meant to me that he was had already gone to heaven. What happened with his body was irrelevant, really. What do you think makes people want to become divers? Do you believe in such mystical coincidences that Dave promised to bring Dion back and did so, but paid a terrible price for it? Share your thoughts in the comments and come back next week for another video. Stay safe.